Yahweh Bahashem, Yahweh Shai Barakatham. The Most High in the name of Christ bless you. Ya Baraka Yahawa, Waya Shamarka, Ya Ar Yahawa, Panyawa Al Yaka Waya Kanka, Ya Sha'a Yahawa, Panyawa Al Yaka Waya Shamlaka, Shalawam Aman. This is Numbers chapter 6, verse 24. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. Anaya Ahab Yahawa Wa Ahab Ha Thawara Aman. I love Yahawa and I love the law. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's get into it. We are in part four of preparing for tribulation. This is the final one. We have talked about the trust that we need to build, trusting in each other, trusting in the most high, trusting in his word. We've talked about getting prepared <clears throat> spiritually, mentally. And tonight we're talking about getting prepared. My man got an AR 15 on getting prepared, <laughs> getting prepared physically. This is a physical thing that we have to go through. you got to get it into your mind. Even though it's spiritual, it is also mental and physical. Let's get into some Paleo Hebrew for tonight. Our word for tonight is the word prepare. In ancient Hebrew, for those of you who, who do not know, you may be familiar with modern day Hebrew, which is not the same. In ancient Hebrew, there is only two vowels. is an A. And an I, you look at all 22 of the characters, you do not find an E or a U or an O. Ancient Hebrew is written from right to left. And this is the pictographic Hebrew. So this first picture is a picture of a palm. That's the Ka. The second one is a Wa. That's a picture of a nail. The third one is a Na. And it's a picture of a serpent. Okay? It's pronounced Kawan. Now, each one of these characters in ancient Hebrew has a meaning for the character. Go ahead and show them what these letters mean. The ka means to cover. If you were going to use your palm to cover something or to open a door or to allow, it's a picture of a palm. It also means to receive. The wa means and. That's what it means. And. It means to add to, to secure, to fasten, and it's a picture of a nail. The na is activity. That's why it looks like motion. It's a snake, but it also means life. It means spiritual, reflective, or shiny. Now, looking at those three characters, what do you think the word kawan, which is prepare, means? You're going to select one word from each column, and you're going to come up with a sentence, and the sentence is going to give you the spiritual meaning of the word kawan. Go ahead and show them what I picked. What does it say? <clears throat> That's what preparing is. What is preparing? To cover and secure life. Remember, <clears throat> one of the biggest pictures of preparing was the Sabbath. We would not receive any manna. No manna would fall on Saturday morning, on the Sabbath day. When, when would the manna fall? The day before, it would fall twice as much so that you would prepare. What does that mean? You would, cover, you would cover your bases and secure your life. That's what preparing is. Go ahead and show them that last one in case anybody needs a, another picture. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. So tonight we are talking about preparing physically. Because we are going to be going into a day that is not like any day that has ever been. And there will never be another day like it. Let me show you what the day looks like. Give me Isaiah chapter 34, and let's begin at verse 1. This is regarding the great tribulation. The scripture says, Come near, ye nations, to hear and hearken, ye people. Let the earth hear and all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it. Who does he want to hear about this? Everybody. Everybody needs to hear about what is going to happen because there has never been a day like this and there never will be after this. Give me verse two. He says, for the indignation of Yahweh, for those who don't know, 
every time the King James Bible uses the word Lord in all caps, that's called superscript. In that place in the ancient Hebrew was the Most High's actual name, which is Yahweh. It means Yah exists. So as we're reading through, you'll notice when it says Lord in all caps, I will be saying the name Yahweh because his name has power. For, for the indignation of Yahweh is upon all nations and his fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Give me verse three. Look, look at how he describes it. This is like a terrible movie. He says, their slain also shall be cast out and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses and the mountain shall be melted with their blood. That's a whole lot of people. That sounds real terrible. I've seen movies like that before. Give me verse four. Watch this. <clears throat> it says, and all the host of heaven. Now watch, start to pay attention. And all the host of heaven. What is the host of heaven? Those are the, those are the armies. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved. Well, which host is this? These are the fallen angels, right? Okay. And the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. And all their host shall fall down. Look at this. Look at this picture. He says, as the leaf that falleth from the vine. Why is he being poetic right there? He wants you to see a picture. He says, and as a falling, what does it say? What is a falling? A falling what? What's falling? A falling fig from the fig tree. When Isaiah said that, it was because Yahweh Shai, who is Jesus, told him it's going to be like a fig that falls from a tree. You need to see the picture of something falling. It doesn't fall immediately down. It's like a fig that falls in. Okay, hits the ground. But see, this is a picture and the Bible is filled with pictures. So what you just saw is the picture. Now, let me show you the revelation of what he was saying. Give me Matthew chapter 24, verse 32. This is Christ speaking. He says, now learn a parable of the what tree? The fig tree. That's what we was just talking about. He says, when his branch is yet tender... And putteth forth his putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So what do I have to do to know when it, when it's harvest time? All I got to do is look at the tree. That tree is, it doesn't just fall off by itself. It falls off because it's fully ripe. It's the right time. Give me verse thirty three. He says, "So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors." What's at the doors? The thing that was just described in the book of Isaiah, that terrible day of the most high's vengeance. When you see these things coming, you know who it's not far away. Okay. Now watch this. The Bible is filled with pictures so that we know what to look for. Let me show you a picture. The most high commands every year in the hot months that we go out. And we dwell in the wilderness in tents and it's intense <laughs> like that double entendre. We dwell out. We go out and we dwell in tents for seven days. What's that called? Feast of Tabernacles. We're out there for seven days. Sometimes it's hot. I almost fainted that first year. I had to lay down. It was hot. Okay, but we do that. You know why you, you know why we do that? It prepares us for being in the wilderness for seven days straight, Right. And then towards the end of the year in December, guess what he has us do? We go out to the wilderness again for seven more days and dwell in tents. And it's cold. I remember it was so cold. We didn't want to play no drums. My fingers felt like they would just bust if I hit the drums. What's that feast called? Feast of dedication. You know why it's called the feast of dedication? Yes, they dedicated the temple. But can you realize how much dedication to his word it requires for you to be like, I need to get this time off. I need to go out there. I need to be prepared for what is coming. Because he's told me whether it be hot and it's boiling hot or it's freezing cold, I still need to be prepared. And he sets aside a time twice a year for me to prepare for the wilderness that is coming. Speaking of that, show them a slide real quick because the Feast of Dedication is coming up next week. December 9th through December 16th is the Feast of Dedication, which is found in 1st and 2nd Maccabees, also found in the book of John. We have not yet figured out where we are going or how we are celebrating. However, this is the important thing to know. The first day is a convocation. Everyone is commanded to show up. And the eighth day is a convocation and everyone is commanded to show up. More information about how we will be keeping it and where will be coming this week. 
All right. So the Feast of Yahweh teach us the timeline for the second coming of Christ. Right. We have to be prepared for whatever weather we go through physically prepared. Right. Check this out. Give me Mark chapter 13. And let's take a look at verse 19. It says, for in those days shall be what? Is it going to be easy? Cotton candy rainbows. It's going to be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation, which Yah created unto this time, neither shall be. So this is going to be the worst time that there has ever been. And you have to start getting prepared. How do I say prepared in ancient Hebrew? Who remembers? Kawan. I have to start getting Kawan. Okay, watch this. Give me verse 20. It says, and except that, now see how it says Lord and it's not superscript, it's not in all caps. It's not talking about the Father. It's talking about the Son. And it says, and except that Adonai had shortened those days, what did he do? He shortened the days. Okay, so the day is no longer 24 hours at that time. Okay. It says, except he has shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, <laughs> whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. You guys know what I'm about to ask you. What is it? What am, who's the elect? Israel. Prove it. Somebody need to prove it. Y'all trying to tell me that Israel is the elect, but I want to see some scriptures that tell me that we are the elect. Anybody got no scriptures in here? Oh, what? I stand up and say it with your chest. <laughs> Tell them where it's at. Give me Isaiah chapter 45, verse 4. Let's prove who the elect is, because I know a whole lot of Christians who think that they are the elect because they elected themselves. <laughs> it says, for Jacob, my servant's sake, and for Israel, mine. Wait, who's my elect? Israel. I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. Okay, so he says he shortened the time for the elect's sake. For whose sake? For Israel, for his chosen. Okay, take me back real quick. Watch this. Uh, back to Mark chapter 13 and give me verse 21. He says, and, and then if any man shall say unto you, give me verse 21. He says, and then if any man shall say to you, lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there. What are you supposed to do? What does it say? Believe him not. I don't believe that. Give me the next verse. It says, for false Christs shall arise, and false prophets shall rise, and shall shew signs and wonders to seduce. Look at what it says. If it were possible. Is it possible? No. Okay. Even the elect. Who's the elect? Israel is the elect. We are the elect. Flesh and blood Israel, the descendants of Jacob, are the elect. Why is it not possible to seduce us? It's two reasons, which is really one reason. What is it? The law and the testimony. Why? I'm not going to be deceived because I, I, I read the Old Testament. I've seen all the pictures. I've seen this movie already. You're not going to try and tell me it's a different movie. I read the Old Testament. I read the New Testament. And I study the scriptures precept upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. So is it possible to deceive me if I'm actually reading the Bible the way it's supposed to be read and I'm doing what it says? I'm not, I'm not going to be deceived. It says if it were possible, the elect would be deceived, but we're not going to be deceived. Give me verse 23. Now watch. Look at this line. He says, but take ye heed. Behold. I have foretold you some things. How many things did he tell you? He says, I have foretold you all things. Oh, so that means that all the answers are in this book. He's already told you when it's going to happen, where it's going to happen, who's going to be involved. All you need to do is stick to the script and read the book so you can figure out what's going to happen. If you don't read the script, I want you to imagine you were an actor and you showed up to your audition, but you have not looked at the script and you just stand there and you decide, I'm just going to freestyle. I'm just going to fumble it. You might make up some really good stuff. You might be really talented and creative. It is not going to be the scriptures. It's not going to be the scriptures. You got to stick to the scriptures in order for you to play your role, in order for you to be prepared for the role that he has put you in from the foundation of the world. You need to know the scriptures. Amen. 
All right. So when he says that he has told us these things before, we have to get into this Old Testament and look at the pictures. Watch this. Keep going. Give me verse uh, 24. It says, but in those days, after that tribulation, does it say before? In the middle of? Okay. So anybody who thought that they was going to be pre-trib or they was going to be mid-trib, the scripture clearly says after that trib, the sun shall be darkened. And what happens next? And the moon shall not give her light. Okay. Give me verse 25. You got to be prepared for that. What you going to need? What did he just tell you to bring? He just said, bring a flashlight. That's all he said was, you're going to need a flashlight. I'm telling you, ain't going to be no stars in the sky. It's going to be dark. You're going to be out there in the darkness. You better bring some light. Now, physically, he's talking about you popping out the flashlight. But spiritually, he's saying, you are the light of the world. You are the light. Okay, now watch this. It says, and the stars of heaven shall fall. What stars are these? These are the angels. We just read about these in Isaiah. And the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. Give me verse 26. And then shall they see the son of man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. You got to be prepared to see that. You got to be prepared. So the only way you can get prepared to see this is you have to believe it first. I know a lot of times they tell you that uh, seeing is believing. Not when it comes to the most high. <laughs> believing is seeing. You need to believe it so that you can see it. Give me this next verse, 27. It says, and then shall he, now this part's important. Then shall he do what? What's he going to do? He's going to send his angels and shall gather together who? His elect. We know who's going to gather Israel. He never promised to gather everybody in the world. He said he's going to gather his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. No matter where Israel is, bloodline Israel, he's going to gather us from that place. What's he going to send to gather us? What does it say? An angel. Okay, now this is a picture. See, if you don't understand the pictures, you won't understand the scriptures. Let me show you the picture because he has already said this. He said, I told you all this stuff before. Let's go all the way back to the Exodus. Give me Exodus chapter 23, verse 20. This is how we're not going to be deceived because we know the precepts. The scripture says, behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. What's the angel going to do? He's going to keep you in the way that leads to the most high. And he's going to bring you there. Some people be like, well, why don't we just go now? You don't know where you're going. That's why you ain't got no map to the kingdom. Bro, the wilderness is right next to Compton. Make a right over here on. And you don't know where you're going. You can't go in advance. He said, I will send an angel before you. Okay. Let's find out about this angel. Now look at the word that it says there. It says, watch behold, I will send an angel before thee. To keep thee in the way. What did Christ say? I am. Okay. He's going to keep you in Christ. Now watch. And to bring thee into the place which I have. Kawan. Yeah. He's already prepared the place. It's already set for you. But you can't go without his messenger. Okay. Now watch. Give me the next verse. Now he gives us a warning. He's like, this angel is not playing around. He says, beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not for he will not pardon your transgressions. What does that mean? You, oh, he said on sight, on sight. That angel is not playing around. You're going to try and have a conversation with the angel about, we don't have to do that. We didn't do My pastor didn't do that in the church. Angel is like, look, either you with it or you're not. He will not pardon your transgressions for my name is in him. Give me verse 22. He says, but if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak. Now, who's speaking through the angel? Okay, that's perfect. Then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies and an adversary unto thine adversaries. You don't have to fight no battles if he's on your side. One more verse. Now, watch what he tells you. He says, you got to get prepared. I've prepared a place for you. Now, I'm going to very subtly tell you where the place is. He says, for mine angels shall go before thee and bring thee in unto the Amorites 
and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. What are all those ites? They ain't, they ain't Israelites. They're all Canaanites. They're all Hamites. Ham, where does he live at? He lives in Africa. Where did he say he's going to take us? I'm taking you to a place where all these people have stolen the land. He's, just, he's not saying, I'm going to take you there and you're going to kill these people and steal their land. He says, I'm going to take you to the land that they stole from Shem. This is the land of Shem, which has become the land of Canaan. And all of these people are in there. And he's like, and I will cut them off. They're not supposed to be in your land anyway. I gave it to you, but they stole it. Okay, now, everybody able to see the picture? Before we went into the promised land the first time, what went before us? An angel did. An angel did. When, before we go into the promised land the second time, an angel has to go before us. The scripture said he's going to send his angel and it's going to gather us together. Okay, hopefully y'all prepared. Somebody um, tell me when it's going to happen. You got to be prepared. What time is it? About 15 minutes from now. <laughs> when is it going to be? Take me back to Mark chapter 13. Give me verse 32. He says, but of that day and that hour of that what? That's very important. Why did he not say of that month and that year? He's being very specific, isn't he? He could have said time. The word time is in the Bible, a gang of times. But of that day and that hour. How come nobody knows the day and the hour? Why? Because of Satan. Because what did he do? Satan changed all the days and the times and the months. And he said, the new day starts at midnight. The new day don't start at midnight. It starts when the sun goes down. He said, you know what? February only has 28, but every so often when I feel like it, let's make a 29th day. He changed everything regarding the days and the hours so that no man actually knows what time it is. Even right now, I would tell you right now that it is Friday night at approximately 845. But if I lived in Israel, it's not that time. If I lived in Australia, it's not that day and it's not that hour, is it? So if it had told you it's going to happen on Friday at 845, that would be a lie written in the scriptures because it wouldn't be the same for everybody in the world. So he says, but of that day and that hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the son, but the father. Who knows? The father knows. What did he do? He revealed it, the secret to his servants, though. We don't know the day. We don't know the hour, but we know the day. <laughs> Isn't that weird? What day is he coming back on? The day of the Lord. It says all over the Bible, like 700 times, the day of the Lord. That day, that's the day of atonement. Okay. Hmm. Give me verse 33. He says, take ye heed. And then he gives you a commandment. What are you commanded to do? So you need to be prepared to watch and pray. For ye know not when the time is. Verse 34. Watch this. says, For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey. That's Christ. He took a far journey. He went back and sat down at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Who left his house and gave authority to his servants. Who was his servants? The prophets. And to every man, that's you, his work. What's your work? You got to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. How many days do you have to do this work? You got six days. Okay. And commanded the porter to watch. The porter is the watchman. When you see a man down, that's the porter. When he sees a man down, he's supposed to warn the next man. Okay. Now watch. Give me verse 35. He says, watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh at even or at midnight or at the cock crowing at even or at midnight, or at the cock crowing. The cock crows when? In the morning, midnight is the middle of the night, even as when the sun goes down, or in the morning. You don't know when he's coming back. Okay? One more verse. 36, it says, Lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. Remember, we just recently did a message called It's Time to Wake Up, Awake to Righteousness. You have to be awake when he comes. Give me verse 37. And what I say unto you, I say unto all. Isn't that what it said at the very beginning of Isaiah? He was like, I need you to tell him and tell your mama and tell your mama. Tell everybody the day is coming. What does he say to everybody right here? I say unto all, watch. So what do you need to be prepared to do? 
Some of y'all not watching though. Some of y'all watching cat videos on YouTube. <laughs> cat videos. You're like, oh, look, they dancing, all kinds of stuff. You're supposed to be watching what is happening in the world because you're preparing to travel. And he said, when ye therefore shall see, see what? You're not going to see nothing if you're looking at cat videos. I ain't got nothing against cats. I'm just, you know, that's what one of the most popular things. You could be watching Baby Shark. I don't know. He said, when ye therefore shall see. So what you supposed to be looking for? The abomination of desolation stand in the holy place. He said, when ye therefore shall see Jerusalem encompassed with armies. Those are the signs that we're looking for. When we see that we have to flee. Now, let me explain this part because we talk about this a lot in our church. And hopefully you guys haven't gotten this confused, but Israelites are scattered all over the world. We are told when we see these things to flee into the wilderness, that's the local wilderness. We are not gathered from the local wilderness. We are gathered from the wilderness of the people or what the Bible refers to as the wilderness of sin. Is that so there's, there's a wilderness, like you can go out into your backyard and if you got enough acreage, there's some wilderness there. Okay. He says to flee to the mountain. So that's the first wilderness that we're fleeing into. We gather there as a family. Everybody finds out what their roles are. And then we begin a journey into the wilderness, that other wilderness. And we get gathered from there. Does that make sense? I know sometimes that's difficult. So Mount Horeb where Moses fed Jethro's sheep is the wilderness that is being spoken of in the scriptures. That's where we're going to be gathered from. That is not in Israel. The wilderness does not take place in the land of Israel. It takes place on the outside of it. <laughs> Let me tell you what's not going to happen. You're not going to get poofed. You're not going to get poofed from here to there. Boom. I know a lot of people, they're like, well, I don't need to get prepared because I'm just going to go poof. And I'm going to be in the kingdom with a gold crown and a white robe. And that's not going to happen. You're not getting poofed because no one ever got poofed. And if we were going to get poofed, he would have told us. But he didn't say, you're just going to get poofed. You ain't got to worry about nothing. The scripture doesn't say that. He says, this is going to be the worst day that anyone has ever seen. And you know what people who don't want to take responsibility do? I ain't worried about that. I'm going to get poofed. <laughs> I'm going to end up in the kingdom. That's not what's going to happen. You're going to need to be strong and have great courage. Let me show you this verse. Give me Joshua chapter one, verse six. I want you to see this was said to Joshua before he walked into the kingdom. Now, you know, Joshua in ancient Hebrew was pronounced Yahweh Shai. And he is a picture of Yahweh Shai leading us into the kingdom. And this is what the father said to him during that time. Because it was all battles. They got out of Egypt and they're like, okay, we good. We regrouped. We're here in the wilderness and we got the big fight ahead of us. But all we have to do is have faith and show up. Now, this is what he says to Joshua. He says, be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land. That's the promised land. Which I swear unto their fathers to give them. What did he tell him at the beginning? He said, be strong. And of a good courage. Give me verse 7. He says, only be thou strong and very courageous. That thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left. That thou mayest prosper wheresoever thou goest. What do I have to do? I got to be strong and courageous. Ain't that right? That's, that's physically prepared. Don't I need to be physically prepared? I need to be, see, here's the thing. There's going to be a whole lot of walking. You not going to walk into the wilderness. If you can't walk around the block, just straight up. When's the last time you took a walk around the block, right? Watch this. Give me verse eight. It'll make more sense in a second. He says, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. What is he telling you to do? He's telling you to get prepared that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success. Okay. This is all preparation for what is coming. I need to be strong. I need to be courageous. I need to be in this book when day and night all day, every day, all day. 
Watch this. Give me the next verse. Verse 9. He says, let me remind you one more time. Have not I commanded thee? Be what? Be strong and of a good courage. That's a whole lot of preparation. There's a lot of preparation. You need to be physically strong and have some physical courage. Be not afraid. Neither be thou dismayed. That means confused. For Yahweh, thy Allah is with thee wheresoever thou goest. Man. Okay. Let's talk about getting physically prepared. Show them a slide real quick. If you're not prepared to survive for 24 hours, how are you going to survive for three and a half years? <laughs> we did our overnight uh, backpacking survival camping trip. It was great. I packed way too much stuff. Why I was going out there for 24 hours and I promised to pack like three outfits thinking I, I got to look good out here in the wilderness. I didn't need none of that stuff. What I needed was a pillow. <laughs> Because I was sleeping on the ground in a tent on a sleeping bag. I was not prepared. Came back with a pinched nerve. Which, you know what I'm saying? I, was, I wasn't ready. Okay. You might want to take a picture of this. This is your basic disaster supply kit. This is basically some of the things that you will need. The great thing is you can buy the whole kit already prepared for you on Amazon. Just depending on how much. But you're not going gonna, gonna to know how to use none of it if you buy it on Amazon. So it's a great idea if you decide to put it together for yourself. You need to be able to survive for at least three days. That's what FEMA says. If you go to the FEMA website, they will tell you, be prepared at all times to survive without food, without water, like in your house. If you needed to leave your house for three days, you should be prepared. You're probably going to need some water and some food and then like a battery powered radio, a flashlight, some first aid, some extra batteries, all that stuff, right? No, it's not on that list that you're going to need. You're going to need the word. You're going to need the law. Yeah. All that stuff is not going to save you. It's going to help you. <laughs> it's not going to save you. Sticking to this word and knowing that's what's going to save you. That's what's going to prevent you from being deceived. Amen. One thing that's very important. And this is what we're building here in our church. Is you're going to need a group of like-minded people that you can trust. Because you can't do it by yourself. You can't. Show them a slide real quick. You guys remember the word trust in ancient Hebrew? It's kasa. We broke it into an acronym. The T is, you need to be with people who are trustworthy, reliable, useful, spiritual, and teachable. They could have all of that, but not be spiritual. And they're off in the woods praying to Buddha somewhere. They about to get you and everybody you love killed. <laughs> right? You out there praying to Buddha. Look, I need you to be spiritual and teachable and useful. All right. Okay. Look, you need food and water for three days. You need clothing for at least three days. Not like me. I took a whole wardrobe out there. You're going to need a place to go outside of the city because Christ said, flee to the mountains. Why don't you want to be in the city? There's going to be looting. They're going to be going door to door, robbing people. You got to be prepared for that. When you go to Walmart, not only is there not going to be any toilet paper, there's not going to be no food. There's not going to be any security. If you just happen to get a whole bunch of stuff, somebody else bigger and stronger than you is going to try and take that away from you. That's my bike. <laughs> That's my bike. <laughs> you need to start. This is how you're getting prepared. You need to start stocking up on necessities. Extra medication, especially if you are diabetic, you're going to need to have some extra insulin. If you know a time is coming where I will not be able to go to CVS and get the thing that I need, you need to start preparing now. Does that make sense? You're going to need a good paper Bible. One of these. You guys remember these things? It's, it's not a relic. I, I actually do have one of these paper Bibles because my tablet is going to die and I'm not going to be able to recharge it. And if I can't recharge it, then I can't recharge me. But if I have this paper Bible, it don't, it don't need no electricity. I just read it and I get charged up. So you need to invest in one of these. Let me tell you guys a quick story, if you don't mind. Um, when I was buying this Bible, my podium Bible, I was like, man, that Bible, $60. $60. I ain't never spent $60 on a Bible. And then the Lord rebuked me. He's like, <laughs> he's like you have spent $60 on some shoes. <laughs> All you're going to do is walk in them shoes. You better spend that money on that Bible. Now I have no problem. I'm like, $120, I'll buy that Bible. Yeah, I, I'll buy it. i buy it. It's an investment in my life. Them shoes, I'm going to outgrow them. You, you feel what I'm saying? Watch. What about weapons and ammo? We're not going to get super deep in that, but let me just tell you this. Um, 
before you need to go out and buy a whole bunch of firearms, you need to make sure that you have the ability to run. If you can't run down the block and run back, <laughs> there's going to be a whole lot of opportunities for you to run. Not that many opportunities for you to pull out weapons. There's a time to fight and there's a time to run and you need to know what time it is. Okay. If you drop your ammo and you're like, Ooh, I can't I get that for me. right? Ooh, I can't, I can't reach it. Then you're not prepared. I don't care how many guns and how much ammo you have. Okay. This is a good idea. Start taking some classes to get prepared. Wilderness survival, the ability to identify plants, some self-defense classes will help you get prepared for what is coming. All of this is the physical preparation for you getting to the place where you will receive salvation. It's work to get there. You have to go through people who want what you got. Yeah, you're going to go into the kingdom, but you're not just going to slide in, roller skating in like this. You're going to have to do some work to get there. That work is keeping you and everybody that you love alive. That's the reason why he told us all of these things. Train up your kids. Thank you for saying that. Yes. Look, be like, if the only knot that you know how to tie is in your shoes, you're not, you're not ready. You're not ready. <laughs> you need to learn how to tie a knot. You need to learn how to make a fire without matches. Right? There's a whole lot of stuff that we need to learn in order to be prepared. What are you preparing for? I'm preparing to live. That's what I'm preparing to live. Give me Matthew chapter 24, verse 9. Let's get to the end of it. It says, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. Are you prepared for that? You didn't die. You just graduated. You graduated from this life into the next. Watch. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Give me the next verse. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another. You need to be prepared to be betrayed by the people that love you. The Bible says that. A man's foes shall be who? They of his own household. You better be prepared for that. And shall hate one another. Give me verse 11. He says, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Verse 12. Look at this part. And because, he says, and because iniquity shall abound. Iniquity is thoughts of wickedness. Abound means to grow. The love of many shall wax cold. Verse 23, but this is the part right here. Verse, verse thir 13, I'm sorry, watch this. He says, but he that shall, what's that word? Endure. endure. How are you going to endure when you didn't prepare? Man, you, you're not going to endure if you're not prepared. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. I want you to see endure as prepare. He that shall prepare. You have to prepare in order to endure. Yeah, there's going to be a whole lot of temptation. And be like, I'll just trade you uh, this for the mark of the beast. I'm like, nope, no, nope, I'm prepared to starve. I've been beginning prepared to starve one day every year to afflict myself. What's that day called? Day of Atonement. He's been telling me there's going to be some days when you don't get to eat for a full 24 hours and you're going to have to like it. I'm prepared for that. He's been training me up for this thing. Let's look at some pictures real quick and we're going to wrap it up. When we look at the pictures, what did we see before? We came out of Egypt, right? The Exodus. Do we come out during the day or at night? I knew it was going to get silent when I said that. Some of y'all is like, I don't remember what they did in that cartoon that I watched. Do not watch cartoons. Read the scriptures. When we came out of Egypt, it was night. It was night. Okay. Did we have time to prepare anything? No, we didn't even have enough time to get our bread, some leaven in our bread so that it would rise. That's how come we celebrate the feast of unleavened bread. We were not prepared. So no matter all the preparation that we do, it's not going to fully prepare us for that thing. It's going to prepare us to get ready for that thing. Okay, now watch. <clears throat> A whole gang of people, like literally more than a million people who had no idea of what was going on were suddenly in a giant group of people and they were running from their lives and there was people trying to kill them. Isn't that what happened? Yeah. And they got right up against an unmovable obstacle. What was it called? The Red Sea. And there was no way for them to go. But there was a man, a messenger, an angel leading them and telling them where to go and telling them just have faith. He's going to get us there. That's exactly what we're going to be experiencing in this next exodus. Let me see. 
Give me Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 33. I'm going to move it just a little bit faster. He says, as I live, saith Adonai Yahweh, surely with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out, will I rule over you. Keep going with me. Verse 34. He says, and I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries wherein ye are scattered with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out. 35. And I will bring you where? To Disneyland. They don't say that. So it's not going to be easy, right? And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people and there will I plead with you face to face. Are we going to see him? Face to face means we're going to see him, right? We're going to see him in the wilderness. Is, does his plead mean beg? He don't beg nobody. Give me Isaiah chapter 66, verse 16. Let's find out how he's going to plead. The scripture says, for by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh. And the slain of the Lord shall be many. So that's what's going to happen in the wilderness. Now take me back to Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 35. He said... Take a look at 35 again. It says, and I will bring you into the wilderness of the people. And there will I plead with you face to face. And he's like, let me show you a picture. Give me verse 36. He said, like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So will I plead with you, saith Adonai Yahweh. How did he plead with our forefathers? You guys remember? He killed them. He killed them. Everybody that was above a certain age he killed them i'm gonna show you this one last piece so that you can be prepared for this give me numbers chapter 14 verse 27 it's going to tell you why he killed them he says how long shall i bear with this evil congregation which wait a minute oh man you get us all together you know we gonna murmur it's hot, it's cold, I'm thirsty, my feet hurt, I just want to lay down. Take me back to things. We're going to be talking so much smack. He says, how long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. Verse 28. He says, say unto them, as truly as I live, saith Yahweh, as ye have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. Verse 29. This is how he pleaded with us in the wilderness. It says, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. And all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Don't be talking no smack in the wilderness. You need to be prepared that whatever you go through, you take that cheerfully, joyfully. You give thanks. Scripture says it's the will of the most high that you give thanks for everything. I don't care what it is. If you get out there, you're going to die when you start complaining about the situation. You on the way to salvation, complaining about what salvation looks like on the way there. I don't know. All right. I don't know. Let me, let me wrap it up. Watch this. Back to Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 37. I just need five minutes. He says, and I will cause you to pass under the rod. This is in the wilderness. This is what we're getting to. And I will bring you into the bond of the what? Which covenant is this? That's a new covenant. Well, what about the people who think that they're already in the new covenant? What's this? Oh, this is that new, new covenant. There ain't no new, new covenant. This is the new covenant and you're not in it yet. You don't get in it until you're standing face to face with the person who's making the agreement. A covenant is an agreement. You got to get into the wilderness in order for you to get into the new covenant. You got to pass under the rod of correction. He brings you into the bond of the covenant. Okay, now you are translated. Give me the next verse. Not everybody is going into the covenant. Give me verse 38. It says, and I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn and they shall not enter into the land of Israel. So where are they at? They're in the wilderness. The wilderness is not in the land of Israel, is it? Okay. They shall not enter into the land of Israel. Ye shall know that I am Yahweh. That's my last section. Give me Luke chapter 21 verse 34. Hopefully this is helping you to get prepared. A lot of it is still mental because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You got to get this stuff in your mind. It's not going to be cotton candy and rainbows. All right, here's our last section. It says, and take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be 
overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares. What are you doing? You're not getting prepared. He says, make sure that you're paying attention. You're watching and you're praying so that the day does not come upon you unaware, but you are prepared for it. Verse 35. For as a snare, what's a snare? A trap. For as a snare shall it come upon all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Verse 36. This is the commandment. He says, watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the son of man. Amen. This is the message that I have for you tonight.